Good morning, Payson Family Church. Let me introduce myself to you. My name is John. I'm one of the elders here at Payson Family Church, and welcome. Do you guys know that uh, it's a very special day, right? Right? Not only is it Sunday, but it's also our monthly fellowship lunch following the service today. So stick around. Don't go out to someplace, Chili's or anywhere like that to eat lunch. Eat lunch with with us here and fellowship and have a great time. But it starts right after the service and it's in the fellowship hall behind the building right here. So we'd love for you to be a part of that. 
Saturday morning men's gathering starts at 8 a.m. here at the church. It's going to be this this Saturday. It'll be here at the church at 8 a.m. It'll be in the fellowship hall behind building behind us. Uh, and it's a time for men to get together and just praise God. You know, yesterday we, we met a new person named Steve that Tom had introduced uh, had invited some uh, this man named Steve, and he gave, what a what a blessing he was to us, you know. And we really enjoyed his time. So we want you to be blessed too. So come to men's uh, Bible ship uh, Bible ship Bible ship Bible study on Saturday mornings, and it's going to be like I said, it'll be here at the church next Saturday. Uh, Diana wants to remind my, remind you that out in the foyer, I don't know if you noticed, but you saw a table out there that was filled with bags, right? cellophane bags and stuff. Well, those are for you. Pick them up, take them out, leave them in your car, hand them out to somebody who may be in need. You know, we have a lot of homeless here at Payson, and a lot of times they they don't get the essentials. So there's there's soap and there's there's food and stuff for them to eat. So and it's it's part of the ministry and what we do here and and how we reach out and it, we don't pick people. God picks them. You know, we just make ourselves uh, more evident to them in, in how we live our life. And we live our lives for Christ. And uh, so grab some of those bags, take them with you. I want to encourage you also that there's some, uh, um, there's some little business cards out there. Take a couple of them, put it in your purse, put it in your wallet, guys. And uh, just go out there and just whenever you meet somebody like Tom introducing us to Steve yesterday, you know. Uh, a lot of times we meet people and we don't know why, but we know it's it's divine appointment by by God. So we're able to offer someone, hey, talk about church and talk about God. And next thing you know, we invite them to church and we have a business card to hand to them so they know where we're located and how to get here. But take those out there. And like I said, Diana wants to uh, to really touch this this area and this town for, for the homeless and the people that are in, in need. Uh, that's how she... She does her ministry. She, she's the head of the food ministry here at Payson Family Church. So, uh, And should I remind them about the food drive? Yeah. We're going to have a food drive starting next next month, September and October. We're going to do a food drive because the holidays are, are really a hard time for a lot of people. And people are needing food and what have you. So we want to stock. We're a little low on inventory in our food bank. So we want to restock all the shelves and everything. So, um We'll start that food drive next month, and during the whole month of uh, uh, September and October, uh, we'll go ahead and just just really make a push on that, so we can fill the feed, fill the food ministry with uh, more food and what have you. And if you don't have any food and you'd like to give monies, Diana will take monies too. Um, but uh, that way we can buy stuff, or she can buy stuff like you know essentials like milk. Uh, which it has to be fresh, and uh, bread. Well, we get plenty of bread, huh? But milk and some other things that she may need, vegetables, fruits, stuff like that. So be a part of that and and help encourage her with her ministry that, that she has here. Um, Sunday morning prayer meeting starts at 9 a.m. For those of you who weren't aware of that, or maybe this is your first time, or your first time in a long time you've attended, we want to encourage you to become a part of the prayer time meeting and that's Sunday morning at 9 a.m. and it's and it's led by Tom Geiger here he's another one of our elders and uh, so be, come be a part of it encourage him uh, that uh, you want to listen more about what God has planned for you well we did a great study this morning in the book of John so uh, um, come in and enjoy that part also uh, Every Sunday morning. And for those of you that are here, in the pews in front of you, you'll see some cards. There are guest cards. There's uh, prayer cards. Uh, there's uh, offertory offer envelopes uh, back there also. But I want to encourage you to go ahead and fill, fill those out. If you know somebody who is in need of prayer, you'd like for us to pray for them. And I want to encourage you also and, and let you know, those of you who have submitted prayers, thank you. Thank you. Uh, because we we pray for those prayer cards every Wednesday night in our Wednesday night to study, and I'll talk about that in a second. But it allows us to use that gift that, that we have, and the, one of the gifts is the gift of prayer. So thank thank you for the privilege of allowing us to, to pray for your fam, family, friends, members, acquaintances, people that you know. So fill those cards. I want to encourage you to fill that out. Um, also, uh, uh, oh, <laughs> 
And when, when you fill one of those cards out or the offering envelopes, uh, you'll see in the back of the sanctuary there's a treasure chest. As you leave today, just drop them in the treasure chest, and we'll make sure they get to the people who handle that, okay? Um, birthdays this week, Preston Steffens. Okay, Mom and Dad, you can clap now. <laughs> anyway, uh, his, uh, his birthday is going to be on the 21st. So, yeah, Kelly. Your, per- your birthday's this week. Pastor, where's he at? Pastor does this bulletin, and I, I just follow what he does. And did you ever fill out a, a guest card, Kelly? Did you ever fill out a guest card? Wow. He's in trouble. He's in trouble. But uh, thank you, and happy birthday. And what day is it going to be? Thursday. Okay. Happy birthday. We're so glad you're part of our congregation here at uh, Payson Family Church. Well, that's about it. Um, I want you to still please perfectly consider your financial support for our ministries here at Payson Family Church because we take what what is ever offered uh, not only to run our church the way we do, but a lot of that money is go to encouraging uh, the community for Christ. Because we, we want to see people's lives change. And we know the only person that can do that is, in God, is God. Uh, but he uses us as tools and instruments. So come and be a part of that. And we thank you so much for that. So let's all stand and greet one another. Welcome to Payson Family Church.
morning church kids you are dismissed
if you just take a moment and watch the little ones as they leave the room, just know that within them are three out of four boxes of donuts because I just threw three empty containers away. So child care people and Sunday school teachers, God bless you. How was everybody? You know, if you're good, I'm good, thank you. If you're good, I'll feed you. If you're mediocre, I'll feed you. And, and if you're rowdy, maybe you, maybe you had donuts too. Um, gosh, my wife is not sitting there. I'm going to be a mess today. She is my rock. Um, go ahead and open up your Bible, Second Peter chapter three. Thank you, uh, worship team and John for announcements and Tom for Bible study time this morning. Where's Jim? Tom, do you know? That's awesome. I didn't know he got a job. I'm so excited. God is good. Speaking of that, every second that we are alive is a gift. And I don't think everybody, I think everybody know. well, okay. I would feel that it would be proper to say that most people know that every moment they're alive is a gift from God. But I will add to that, I don't think most people who know that Acknowledge it. The little gap in, in time that was my thinking in that phrase was God's grace of time that we're still here. When he used to do a lot more construction and I got up at those awful hours that I did and went to the job site, the saying was, hey, how are you this morning? And the answer was, two feet hit the floor be a good day but honestly it's it is literally God's grace that we're sitting here that we're breathing that that it's God's grace that I'm talking you may not see it that way but it's God's grace that we're in fellowship that we live where we live that we've been allowed to be blessed with what we have it When I think of Scripture and I think of Jesus' time of ministry, small debate on it, we're going to call it three years. If you don't like it, that's fine. It, it's okay. Um, but about three years of earthly ministry, and the world still isn't the way that God intended it to be. But I can tell you this because of His grace. It's where He's allowed it to be. But Jesus lived his life in such a way that even though when he left, there were hurting, there were crippled, there were lost, there were evil, there were good, there, were, there was work to be done. At the end of his life, he was still able, still able to say this. I, I get this statement out of John 17 when he speaks to the Father. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. That every moment in time that we have is, is God's grace. And even though everything isn't the way we want it to be, it, it doesn't mean that there isn't work to be done or that for some work is done. The overall concept of time, I think, is a, is a mess in in. If I broke it down to a day, I'm, I'm going to lose some of you. I'm going to go around a big tree and come back to it. Even though Jesus left this earth and there was work to be done, he was able to say, I did the work that I was here to do. The question is, do we understand that while we'll never get done, what we perceive has to be done 
we can still get done what God has called us to do. That means we've looked at every moment of time to be God's grace. That means that we have taken every moment of time and realized this is a gift. I need to do something with it. I think the goal of a Christian is to use our time so wisely once we know the one who created time that at the end of our time here that, that we would be hearing the words, Jesus in a parable, Matthew 25, 23, about a master who went away and came back. These words, his master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. That is not a statement that is made because you or I or us as the church have accomplished everything that we perceive has to be done. Or that you and I, or us as a church, has done everything our way because we feel we can do it better. That is a statement that is given to us that we would be able to receive from God. Where he would say, well done, good and faithful servant, because you and I have used our time, which is his gift of grace to us, for his glory and not our own. We're getting to the end of the second epistle of Peter, and wrapping it up, we get this concept that you and I have to trust God with our future, and not that we set it aside, but that we live right now for him, knowing that whatever comes, he's got that. There's a concept of living now for the future, but we don't live because of the future. We don't live in the future we live now, and Peter is going to finish explaining, this is how I need you, this is how God wants you, this is how a proper Christian lives in the now, knowing that Jesus is coming, because we trust him that he'll come, so we live in the now. Last week we started with this, it's just a basic statement, that the future belongs to God alone. Peter responds a, a little bit back in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, which was last week. There's a problem that Christ hasn't come back in the minds of some, that false teachers and even people congregationally in a gathering were saying, he hasn't come back yet, he's not going to come back, or that he hasn't come back, so he won't come back. He's proving a negative, which is one of the worst arguments to ever be on that side, is trying to prove a negative. Well, if you would have done this, then this would have happened. There's just, you can't prove the future in the now. And these people had a struggle. Well, he said he'd come back, and he hasn't yet come back, so he won't come back. It's a weird concept that we get caught up in our life. I get all these promises in Scripture that I, I know what God has said, and, and I've seen what he's done but why hasn't he done that for me? So we get small our religious people who are, they're so expectant of, well, now I've given my life to, to God, why doesn't he give back everything to me? He said he'd come back, he'd finish what he started, that, that evil would be wiped away, and we get caught up in this I guess this little bubble of, I thought Christianity was about me instead of about God. And Peter's saying, I'm going to paraphrase for him. Stop trying to be God. Stop trying to, to choose his timeline for him. He gave you life. Live that life for him. Trust his timeline. Well, here we are a couple thousand years later, and Jesus has not returned. If you didn't know it, the rapture hasn't happened. If it had, we missed something, right? But technically, Jesus is two days, two days farther away from coming back than he was when Peter wrote this. If you go by God's timeline and not man, a thousand years is a day. You ever thought about that? Why is God taking so long? Well, so long is in your mind and on your wrist and hanging on your wall and not in God's eternity. 
it's a tragic irony to me to think that these Christians of the day would take what, what God had done and was explained in this verse that Peter said, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. That you have these people falsely lying. That's a, a double whatever that is. Lying, which is false. They were lying, saying, well, he hasn't come back, so he won't come back. But Jesus' reason for not coming back is so that they can repent. But instead of repenting, they're complaining. Now, make that personal. As a Christian, we've repented. We've accepted forgiveness. We've accepted the work of Jesus Christ on the cross on our behalf. That's what it means to be a Christian. Not be perfect, but live as someone who's forgiven. It's a tragedy for me to think that there are people out there that are wasting time that God has given this world so that people would come to salvation and they're wasting their time complaining that he hasn't come back yet instead of accepting, oh, there's a reason why there's still time left. For a Christian, how tragic is it that we have taken the same amount of time and yes, we've repented, but that's all we've done with it. So Peter, as he finishes up, is going to kind of give a wake-up call. Talking about the future belonging to God alone, last week we started with this, that Jesus will return, focus your hope on it. I stated last week that the headlines, and boy, the headlines between what I said last week and what I'm going to repeat right now, the headlines do not have the corner on the kingdom of God. My mom used to say, um, and I'm going to, I'm going to, curse for you southerners, cuss for you, the rest of you in church. My mom used to say, the world's going to hell in a handbasket. Anybody ever heard that? Big handbasket, right? But we look at the world and here's our choice. I'm going to focus on the chaos around me, including within me. For those of you that can't get over something that you've been forgiven for, let it go. It's been paid for, side note, but a very important one. But do we focus on the chaos? Just take Israel. Became a nation 48, I believe, if I have my numbers right. 2000, I'm sorry. Yeah, was it 2000 and... No. No. I'll get it. Everybody stare where I'm staring. I'll get it. 1913 or something, there were 8,000 Jews in the Palestine area. God's word said that they will come from scattered and regroup. 1948, in a moment, which is a prophecy, Israel becomes a state. Here we are, 2021 in the census there, there were over 6 million Jews, 100 years, 8,000 to 6 million. And Jesus is coming back, but we're focusing on some pretty negative stuff right now. They were focusing on some pre pretty negative stuff. Let's see, the first century church, there were government authorities that didn't like them, didn't want them to meet, didn't want them to say the word Jesus, didn't want them to live didn't want them to take care of each other. The government wanted to be the ones that takes care of people. Uh, yep, talking about back then, not right now, or maybe both. People were out to get them. They didn't have freedom to worship. And Peter's telling them, instead of looking around, instead of looking at the television, instead of watching the news or reading the local tablet, maybe they had a parchment they wrote it on instead of looking around you take your focus off of what is going on right now and just take a glimpse of this fact that Jesus is coming and if you can't find your hope in that then you don't realize the impact of that Jesus will finish what he started and that's not a repercussion thing to where you can go up and tell someone you don't like oh you'll get yours in the end that's a horrible thing to say by the way because what they're going to get is going to be eternity without God so just 
as much as I'm justice oriented, one of the things I watch in my heart is I need to care more about them not getting what's coming than getting what's coming. But if you and I understand Jesus is going to return, focus your hope on that. The future is secure. He's going to do what he said. Now I can come back and live my life now and focus on better things than what's bombarding me. The headlines meant to scare, meant to control, meant to, and I'm not going to get political. I'm just going to be honest. The best way to control somebody is to make them dependent on you. The best way to make them dependent on you is to be the solution for the problem. The best way to be the solution for a problem is to cause the problem. That's worldly leadership 101. Be needed so you can be in charge. Well, we understand Jesus is coming back, but if we're going to take that and find our hope in it, we've got to believe it. So we started with fix your hope on it. If you believe it, fix your hope on it. Let's pray before we get started this morning. God, we thank you for your word. It's encouragement, it's challenge, it's its ability to reach so deep into our soul that it is for God our our training in righteousness God let today be the day that we allow your word so deeply into our hearts that it changes the way we live God, I would ask that every day, but today especially as we, as we read from Peter's second epistle, understanding in a nutshell, nothing here has to affect us, that nothing on this earth has to change us, that we can be who you called us to be because you're going to do as you said you're going to do. That gives us the freedom to live the life you called us to live and leave the rest up to you. God, as always, I ask you to speak through me in spite of me as, as we dig in. Be with those that are sick and hurting. Heal hearts and minds and spirits today. I thank you for being our God and for allowing us to be your children. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. When it comes to truly living as a Christian, I guess this is the part of every sermon, and it should be part of every sermon, proper spiritual perspective matters. If you don't have your mind on Christ or live with the mind of Christ, if you don't understand who God is, I don't know if you can truly understand if you're saved or not. Now, I'm not saying we have to know everything about him. You can't. But he's given us enough. This is my, this is my only prop. I need more props. Um, maybe just a bigger one. You don't have to understand this whole thing, but there's enough in there to understand who he is. And when we understand who he is, we get a proper perspective. And that perspective doesn't have to be seen by everybody else, but it has to be known by us. There's a story about uh, Abraham Lincoln during the Civil War, and things were going his way. It's purportedly written... I wasn't there. Some of you think I might have been. I was not there, but he was asked, hey, is God on your side? When things are going good, is God on your side? And his answer was this. He says, sir, my concern is not whether God is on our side. My greatest concern is to be on God's side, for God is always right. If the food was ready, we'd pray and close right now, because that's, that's just... But it's not ready, so you, got, you need to sit anyway. That's got to be how we've decided to live. As, as Christians, we go from my way to God's way. And by the way, my way, I didn't start it. It started in the garden. We truly are never in control. We're only in control of our decisions, but we're not in control of our own influence. You cannot influence you. You're either influenced by this world or the enemy, or you're influenced by the God who is victorious over all of it. That's it. There is no in-between. Well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not evil, which is great, by the way. That's a good, if, that should be on a t-shirt. I'm not evil. That's good. But there is no, I'm in control and everything's okay. You're either 
under the influence of the world, this that we're born into sin, or you're under the salvation of the one true God through Jesus Christ. And you and I need to know our perspective of that is not, hey, I've got a great idea, let's get God on board. It's God had a great idea, I've taken my part in it, I want to be on board with him. It's kind of a catchphrase to where we throw it out too much. Let's ask God to bless our plans. But if you didn't get that plan from God, and here's what Abraham Lincoln says, he says, I don't want to get God on my side. I want to be on his. That's a King David thing. And I throw that out there because if you know King David, you know he wasn't perfect. So stop striving to be perfect and start striving to be in God's will. Living for God and His ways right now, trusting Him that our tomorrow is covered, we can ask ourselves, am I striving for my future? Am I working right now to try and take care of tomorrow? Or am I leaving tomorrow up to Him and I'm taking care of right now because that's what He has for me? That's what we're going to cover. A couple simple answers of that thought from Peter. Let's go ahead and read 2 Peter chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 11 and close this out today. Remember if I asked you to go there yet or not. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 11. I don't see pages turning. You must have already been there. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved. By the way, that's everything. It's gone. Even all the stuff you buried in the backyard for an emergency. You may not be here. It may last, but there will be a day when it's totally gone. He says, since it's all going to be gone, what sort of people ought you to be? In lives of holiness and godliness. What sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? It's all going to burn up. It's all going to go away. You need to live in light of that. Verse 12, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn but according to his promise, we are waiting for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloveds, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. Count the patience of our Lord of salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him. As he does in all his letters when he speaks in, uh, in them of these matters... There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and the unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. Verse 17, Therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with your air of lawless people, with the air of lawless people, and lose your own stability, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and and to the day of eternity. Amen. Here's what we're going to focus on today as Peter turns this corner, closes this out. It's all going to burn. Don't worry about it. Point two is Jesus is going to return, so live in light of it. He's going to come back, put your hope in it. He's going to come back, live because of it. The way you live because of what you believe. Eternity is real. Everyone enters it, by the way. Everybody enters eternity. Time's going to be done. Eternity's, we're, when I say start, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say we're going to start in eternity. Eternity doesn't have a start or a stop. But either you're going to be with God forever because you accepted Jesus Christ, not because you're perfect, not because that you do everything right, and, and not because everybody thinks you're fantastic, but because Jesus paid the price for your sins and you accepted that. Or you're going to spend eternity, and know this, this is the best it'll ever get for you because he, eternity is going to be worse and forever. It's going to be outside of the presence of God. Eternity is a topic that we've got to talk about. Eternity is a topic that's got to influence how we live all the time. It's a story about a minister visiting with an elderly woman in the nursing home and being evangelistic, this young guy says to her, he says, hey, at your age, you should be thinking about the hereafter. The older woman said, oh, I do all of the time. 
No matter where I am, in my room, down to the cafeteria, down in the rec room, I ask myself, what am I here after? <laughs> Give it a minute. C.S. Lewis was serious about talking about the hereafter and kind of the lapse that we're in right now. He says this, it's since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this one. Think about it. I mean, how many Christians are walking around right now and their witness and their evangelism has to do with eternity as opposed to just, hey, there's more for you here. Have a good day. Come to church. When you and I, as Christians, when the church as a whole, stop thinking that eternity matters to our now, then we stop living for eternity in our now. Again, there's no worse witness that you can be involved in is when somebody comes to you and says, I didn't know you were a Christian. So popular author and preacher Joseph Stowell, he wrote this, when we begin to believe in the reality of the other side, we start having, excuse me, we start behaving differently on this side. When we truly begin to believe in it, I know we say it that, and I say it a lot because I really want to get there, but in God's timing, when we, when we really truly believe this does get better, and in God's timing, we will be there, and he has a purpose for why I'm here, but I know that in the end, I'll be with him, and that I've been justified and forgiven, and I'm being sanctified right now, but there will be a day when I am glorified and complete in him. When we truly walk around believing that, the words that come out of our mouth, the actions that come out of our bodies, the attitude and, and the countenance that we portray is... I believe in eternity, and I, I want you to believe in it too. It's, it's more than just, hey, come to church. It's meet my Savior, understand my Savior, know that you can be with my Savior for eternity. Last week, we noted that Peter was very strongly focused on the reality of the second coming. That's where he, he started to close this down, and that true believers have to find their hope in it. But we got to ask ourselves this very important question. While we wait for him, what do we do? We put our hope in him, but we don't sit still. While we wait for Jesus to return, what do we do? By the way, if you're confused on the topic, there will be a day, I believe, there will be a rapture, and there, then there will be a tribulation, and the second half is the great tribulation, and then we have a, a pocket of time, and Jesus comes back and rules and reigns. That's the second coming, and the rapture isn't. So for scripturally what I believe is the church is taken away and then there's time that goes by before Jesus literally puts feet on the earth we meet him in the air and I don't want you to confuse the rapture with the second coming the second coming is when Jesus comes and it's over the rapture is when he takes us out of the way so we didn't incur God's wrath in the end time so what do we do we know he's coming how do we live in light of that what do we do while we're waiting and for for us I would say waiting for the rapture Peter answers it. we got two of them today. He starts with this. Not just knowing godly things, but actually living godly lives. Oh, wait a minute. I didn't sign up for that. I gave my life to the Lord thinking he's going to forgive me. And by the way, he does. I gave my life to the Lord thinking that things are going to get better. And by the way, they will. Eventually. You and I need to understand this. We're still here. We're still here, and it's not just about, oh, I'm getting to know God better. It's I'm living out what I get to know. This is a bombshell for a lot of Christians in the world today is the statement, oh, there's something for me to do, or I should actually acquire change. The word is sanctification. We've talked about it a lot. Things should change in me, and absolutely is the answer. It's Living in light of I truly believe that Jesus will come again means I just don't have to know godly things. I have to actually live out a godly life. Christians aren't supposed to be separated from the rest of the world because we believe something different. We're separated because we live something different. Does that make sense? Jesus didn't come and preach. He came and lived. 
The key phrase in this paragraph that, that we read it was verse 12, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God. Waiting for, that literally in the original language means to eagerly be expectant as we're looking forward to something. Remember when you were a kid and it was getting closer to Christmas, how you started acting better because you wanted better things? Let me do a kid check in here. Okay. Remember when you were told if you're good, you can have ice cream after dinner and about 4.30 when you're told to wash your hands, you start getting better? Just me? Maybe I'm in the wrong crowd. I thought we were all human. Truly knowing that something is coming should change how we are. But let's not wait, by the way, until you see one sign, which I just gave you a few a minute ago talking about Israel. Let's not wait till we think we're getting closer to take the godly things that we've learned and put them into practice. Because we realize that the world and its works are going to be dissolved, that everything around us is, not everyone, but everything around us is going to be burned up. Everyone around us will go one of two places. we got to live accordingly. Well, how do you do that? Here's how it starts. Just be constantly ready. When I get into a conversation about the rapture and someone that I talk to has a different view than me, here's where I come to terms with it doesn't matter if I make them believe what I believe or they make me believe what they believe. Both of us believe the same thing. We need to be ready. The Lord's come and be ready. If you knew he was coming tomorrow, you'd wait till late tonight. Right? We don't know. No man knows the day or the hour. Constantly being ready is a status of living a godly life. The Christian's life is, it's not like the medical student. For, and I'm using medical student because I liked this story that I made up. The Christian life isn't like the medical student who waits for that last big test before they get their, their medical license and they cram and, and, and they read and they memorize for that last week and late night so that they get to the point on that one day and on this one day, I hope I can recall everything and then I can repeat it. That's not the Christian life. The Christian life is the professor who's actually a doctor who every day of his life is spent doing what he had already learned and now he does it not only every day but teaches it to others so they can learn how to do it every day. Christian life isn't up here. It's this. It's, sorry, freaked some of you out there. It's our movements. It's our actions. It's our words. It's our mindset. It's our heart. It's not our knowledge. The Christian life is about being constantly ready because we're living it out. As Christians, we've been given a mission. God has given us purpose and I know the Great Commission, but let me expand on that. There's a professor, Paul Marshall. He writes about our Christian mission. Here's what he says. To work, to perform, to develop, to progress, to change, to choose, to be active, and to overcome until the day of our death or the day of our Lord's return. That is not a sit still. That is not just knowing. That is living. It's constantly being ready. As Christians, everything that we do now should be a direct result of what we know is coming. As Christians, everything we do now should be a result of whose we now are, capital W. As Christians, everything we do now means we're constantly ready and we're always living for God because now we will always and forevermore belong to God. The Apostle Paul encouraged Titus one of these small books a lot of people don't read. He's talking about the inseparable link between faith and practice, or, or better stated, the link between our belief and our behavior while we wait in Jesus' return. And here's what Paul said. It's Titus 2, 11 to 15. For the grace of God has appeared, that's Jesus, bringing salvation for all people, 
training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope. Now, if I just stopped right there, what he's saying is this, that because Jesus has come, he has paid the price for our sins, that has brought salvation, and we accept that salvation, and because of that salvation, we are now being trained to live better while we wait. Honestly, it's like getting dessert first. We have the ability to live a godly life in the presence of God before physically being in the presence of God. He continues, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself to us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, who are zealous for good works, that's daily living for him, declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. By the way, exhort and rebuke with all authority to a Christian means this. You live in right and you're helping others live right, the truth in love given to them, hey, this isn't biblical, I want to help you through this, you're stumbling, uh, bearing one another's burdens, which is our struggles or our sins, declaring these things that we are to be living this way until he comes, that we have a job to do, we're not just waiting on the prize at the end. He finishes, let no one disregard you. But if a believer ever starts to neglect living for that blessed hope, if we ever slow our role so much that we are asked, hey, are you, are you really a Christian? Or I, I thought you, you know, loved Jesus. If we ever get to that point, we're going to quickly develop a cold heart. We're going to find ways to be mad at God. We're going to blame him for things that the enemy brought into this world and our flesh has, has undertaken Instead of receiving him and his grace and his forgiveness and his strength, we're going to actually step back from being on fire for him to living an un... Lost the word. We're not going to make an impact. Being ready for Jesus' return means living for him as if he's standing right beside him, as if we're standing right beside him at all times. And that's not a fear, by the way. There should be a relief in that. You ever walk down an alley in the dark? You know, before you men were cool and macho and tough, there are times where we wouldn't want to be alone. We ought to live our lives like we're not alone. Therefore, he starts with this. Our conduct should be characterized by holiness and godliness. The word holy there means to be separate. God is holy. He's separate from sin. There, it, the word holy is so deep, but for the context that it's in right here, it means to be, kind of be cut off, to separated for a purpose. There's a reason behind it. Israel, bless you, was a holy nation because God called the Jews out from among the Gentiles, separated for a purpose. Christians are called out from the godless world around them and set apart for God's purpose. The word godliness could also be translated piety. Biblical word means the same thing. It describes a person whose life is devoted to pleasing God. I'm going to do things that I know make God happy. I'm going to live in a way that makes God happy. Godliness is a privilege and a duty, and it is for every Christian. To pursue godliness, a personal attitude toward God, has to be something that results in actions that are pleasing to Him. If you want to live for somebody, you're living to please somebody. And again, it's, it's not perfection. There's not one place in the Bible, and the word perfect, by the way, is in the Bible, but in the context it's written, it always means complete. Not sinless, it means complete that we are to be complete in Christ. Godliness is not just about watching the way we live. It's about enjoying who we live for. It's, it's honestly more than just, hey, look at how I'm living. It's I'm pleased to live this way. It breaks down to this next step. We've got to increase our desire to live in purity. If you and I understand Jesus is going to return, I'm going to live in light of it. I'm not going to just know godly things. I'm going to live a godly life that I'm going to be constantly ready. My context is going to be 
character, my conduct, characterized by holiness and godliness, I'm going to seek purity. That's the base of this. I'm going to seek to live in purity. Again, not perfection. Peter, along with other New Testament writers, talk about purity quite a bit. But purity is not simply, again, knowing the doctrine and, and the modus of the life that God has for me to live. It's having it in your heart. It's a result of what you truly believe, and it's about loving the fact that Jesus is right next to you all the time. And because we've escaped the corruption that's in this world or the impact of it, that we're separated because this world is not our home, because we're strangers and pilgrims headed for a better world, you and I should be different, not odd. We should stand out because we're different and not looked at as we're odd because when you're different, you attract people. When we're different for Christ, we attract people. And here's a measurement as a Christian. When you're odd and you claim it's for Christ, you're going to repel people. We are called to be different because this is not our home. And if we're diligent watching for his return, if we live to be godly, and if we live to be holy, and if we seek pure lives, then we're not going to be ashamed that we're different. People are going to see something in us, know that it's not in them, and then look for it themselves. When people were attracted to Jesus and what he had to say, his message, it wasn't because, oh, I want to follow you. I want to be an outcast. I want to be seen as subhuman. I want the government to hate me. I want, I want to stand out and be ridiculed. It was because that's something I don't have and that's something that I need. And for you and I, living holy, godly, and lives that are pursuing purity, that's why Peter says this way you can be meeting him without spot or blemish. Along with that point too today is we also need to be caring more about salvation and discipleship than comfort and elitism. Verse 15 that we read refers back to verse 9. It, it has to do with God being patient. And the reason that he's patient, he's not lazy, he's not looking the other way. He has a desire for as many people to come to him through his son as possible. God had every reason long ago to just squish this world like a bug. Think of his power that he created it all. Think of how easy he could end it all. But in his mercy, you and I have today. In his mercy, he is long-suffering with us. And if there is one group of people in the world that should always key off of, God has been merciful and given me another moment in time, I need to spend it wisely. It's his church. The world doesn't see it as a gift, but it is. And he gave that gift, whether they receive it or not, it's there for them to take. God is patient, hoping that more would come to him. And because Jesus has come and opened the way for humanity to go back to that relationship that God intended... He opened it, he's going to close it. That time is important, and we must be constantly seeking to know and portray biblical truths in that time. If you and I are going to influence people, if you and I are going to grow closer, we can't take this time lightly. We can't take this time halfway. We can't do Christianity for our pleasure or to feel that we're greater. Verse 16, re referencing the teachings of Paul, and by the way, there's some doctrinal hubbub that Paul and Peter didn't get along, but they did. And here's a reference to Peter realizing Paul's knowledge and understanding. Verse 16 said this, there are some things in them that are hard to understand, talking about the teachings of Paul, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do other scriptures. You and I have to be careful that we don't get caught up in scripture twisting. This goes beyond false teaching. This is taking something out of this book and rewriting it and saying it's in this book. And it happens a lot. There's a tickling of the ear. There are pastors that are more concerned about 
bums in the seats than, than souls in heaven? Christianity isn't something that we should run from because, oh, this is too hard, I can't do it. It's something we should run to as this is my saving grace, that what Jesus did is on my behalf, and now I'm going to take everything he said at face value and live the way he's asked me to live. I won't be perfect at it, but I will be persistent to follow it. Regarding the ignorant and unstable, here's what was happening back then. They would twist or distort Scripture. Some were unstable because they were unlearned. They didn't know the truth. I've been there. I admitted to that. There was Scripture I used to preach to young people, and then I realized that wasn't Scripture. There's something really cool that I heard, but it's not in the Bible. But there are some that twist Scripture because they're evil. And when I say evil, they, you know, they don't have... Our, our picture of someone who's evil, a pitchfork and, and horns and a red suit on, but they have intentions that are evil. And they twist Scripture to fit their life or to make their justification work. Somebody could be learned, someone could know the truth, and still be unstable with Scripture. And what Peter says is Paul's teaching was deep, and some people didn't want to accept it. Some people didn't hear it, but some people didn't want to accept it, and they twisted it and taught it differently. And if you read some of the Pauline letters, you will see that Paul refers to it. That's not what I taught you. That's not what I brought to you. I brought you the truth. We brought you the truth. You and I as Christians, you need to know something that if If someone takes something that is in here and twists it a little bit to change the narrative, it is not God's word anymore. And if we're going to care more about salvation and discipleship than comfort and elitism, we've got to call out, hey, that's not what God is saying. And Peter is saying here, beware of those people. It's closing up this uh, false teaching narrative that he has. But few persons are more dangerous in a congregation, and I've I've been in churches, this is not one of them, but more persons are, excuse me, few persons are more dangerous in a congregation than the one who has great scriptural knowledge but has no love for the truth of the character of God. They have so much knowledge of scripture, but they do not follow the scripture they have the knowledge of. That they can quote scripture and they can use scripture and they can fit any title or narrative that they want, but they don't love like God says to love. They don't forgive like God says forgive. They don't know their place like God says know your place. I'm in charge. You're my child. That's our relationship. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 8.1, these type of Christians are puffed up by knowledge and do not build up in love. You and I, constantly seeking know, to know and portray full biblical truth, means that we know it and we live it, not we know it and we twist it, we know it and we make it fit. There's a vast difference between an academic understanding of Christianity and a practical, full of faith understanding of Christianity. It goes back to the story of that college student or the medical student who is getting the academics. They have to remember the academics. They have to pass a test of the academics. Or the teacher, the professor who is actually a doctor, and they practice this every day. It's the same knowledge, but one is used and one is known. It's the difference between Hebrew teaching in schools and Greek teaching in schools. In America, we follow the Greek teaching concept that we put it in your brain, and if you could spit it back out in a short enough amount of time, we're going to go beyond it saying that you know it. But in the Hebrew, when they were, were growing up, in the Hebrew nation, they would have to not only know it, but then recite it and then live it out, and then someone says, okay, you've learned it. That's us seeking to know and portray full biblical truths. Let's be honest, most of us know far more of the Bible than we live out. Just be honest, we're human. Most of us know more Scripture than we show. What are the chances that there's a part of Scripture that someone could use, let's say, against you and say, hey, doesn't the Bible say this? And you've got to weasel your way out of that. We've got to stop this. We've got, to, we've got to put this separation not only back in the church but back in our Christian lives that there is a way that, that we want to live and we'll try and make Scripture fit it or a way the Scripture says and we're going to make our life fit that. Peter's talking about the same problems in the church back then that are in here now. 
that people would get some head knowledge, but they'd have no heart attitude of knowing God. You and I must maintain a desire to know God's Word. John Wesley wrote about his need for God's pure Word in his life. Here's what he said. I do have this on the screen. He said, I'm a spirit come from God and returning to God, just hovering over the great gulf till a few moments, hence I am no more seen. I drop into an unchangeable eternity. I want to know one thing, the way to heaven how to land safe and happy on that happy shore. God himself has condescended to teach me the way. For this very end, he came from heaven. He hath written it down in a book. Oh, give me that book at any price. Give me the book of God. I have it. Here is knowledge enough for me. Let me be homo unius libri, meaning let me be a man of one book. Could you imagine the impact we can make on this world if we spent more time, instead of talking about Jesus, living how Jesus taught us to live? Again, not perfection. For those of you that think, oh, you're holier than thou. No, I'm worse than you. I don't mind saying I'm Paul. I don't mind saying that there are things in my life that God says, what are you doing? Of course, the flesh says, oh, it's not a big deal. Then I think of Christ and the fact that he says everything's a big deal. Your influence is a big deal. Your attitude's a big deal. Your your, Your instruction to people is a big deal. Could you imagine having the heart saying to God, let me be a man of one book. Hey, how do I live my life? Let me show you because it's right here. Could you imagine if every Christian's heart desire was God's way first? And I'm not saying that we're you know, we've lost salvation or that we're harmful people. I'm just saying that there is more for us in the time we have left of desiring, I am going to constantly be in God's word so that I'm seeking the truth of it, so that I portray the reality of it. This means this. As individuals and his church, we need to constantly seek to grow in the grace and his knowledge, meaning let's derive encouragement from his scripture and then let's live it out for his glory as a body we must be committed to one another in continuing our spiritual growth nobody plat oh no let me take that back we do plateau nobody reaches the top and we need to be encouraging each other hey let's keep moving towards the top Peter has sufficiently warned us that false teachers are multiplying, that they're in the church. They're still here. They're still around us. Unfortunately, they're not as, how do I say this? Unfortunately, false teaching is accepted more than it was in Peter's time. Our time is short. God needs bold men and women who will take a stand that will resist false teaching, live godly lives, bear witness of the saving grace of Jesus Christ. And, and because time is short, this sanctification process is vital in our lives. Verse 17 that we read, Peter says this, You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, you know this truth, he's saying, take care that you're not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability. Those words translated take care mean be constantly guarding yourself. That's all throughout Scripture. Be on guard. Be on guard against the enemy. Be on guard against false teaching. Be on guard that you don't justify your own actions and your flesh isn't winning. Peter's readers, boy, saying that out loud, I don't know why I put those two words together. Peter's readers, but they knew truth. They were converted, a lot of them from Judaism to Christianity, but Peter's readers were 30 years out from Christ's ascension back to the right hand of God. They know scriptural truth. The Bible wasn't canon yet. But he still warned them that knowledge alone isn't sufficient. Knowing the truth isn't sufficient. You've got to be on your guard that someone doesn't tr- uh, trick you or twist that knowledge. What was the danger that he saw? He said this, 
that believers are going to be carried away with the air of lawless people, that we're going to get in the midst of a crowd of Christians that really don't care. They want to claim Christianity, but don't want to look like Christ, and we're going to slowly move into that area. It happens all the time in relationships, by the way, for any young people or older people that are relationship-oriented. You and I cannot keep a level of I'm living for God if we don't surround ourselves with somebody else who helps us stay there. And you could be, and here's why, it's not a shot on Walmart. Now, anybody here work at Walmart? Okay, this isn't a shot on Walmart. But you can walk in Walmart and in five minutes be questioning your Christianity. Honestly. This is a Christian town, but you can walk in Walmart and you can see people that you may have seen in church, but whether it's the way they're dressed, the way they're acting, the words are coming out of their mouth, you're wondering to yourself, what do I believe? Because I thought I believed something, and what I'm seeing is not what I thought I should be seeing. And that's anywhere. It could be in your family. It could be at the mall. Oh, the mall. Yeah, it's at the mall. Boy, I really struggle with dads who, who let their daughters go to the mall. It's a whole other topic because I'm justice-oriented. You and I are being told, be on guard. This, will we lower our expectations? Will we come into, I, I was living for Christ, but, you know, I hang out with these six different people, and we really, you know, we get along, and everything's okay, but now I'm just, yeah, how really important is it? What if I stood up, I might offend them. If I do what's right, yeah, it's best for me, and it pleases God, but, you know, am I going to lose this friend? Scripture teaches that there can be no communion between truth and error, not Christian and non-Christian. Scripture teaches there must be relationship between Christian and non-Christian. What this is saying is between two Christians, don't hang around with somebody who doesn't want to follow the Bible, but they still call themselves a Christian because I guarantee you what you're going to do is start giving in to what they're saying. It happened in the garden. It's the subtle little differences. Did God really say that? Or here's what I think that means. You and I are being warned, and this isn't, hey, stay away from people who don't know God. We are told, go find those people. Go be a light. Go, go be salt in this world. But when it comes to the Christian body that Peter is writing to, he's saying, there are some in this body that will justify their evil and call it Scripture. Don't even hang out with them because you'll start giving in to that. One of the greatest tragedies of numbers-based evangelism is bringing spiritual babies in, counting bums in a seat, and moving on, leaving them untrained, uneducated, unloved, unguided. Jesus said it perfectly. If you go to the end of what he said, go therefore into all the world, make disciples of all nations, meaning people groups. By the way, that's people outside of your comfort zone. But then he continues baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Holy Spirit. And then he continues and teaching them to observe, obey, live out my commands. We get so giddy about converts. The church can't bring in a bunch of people, introduce them to Christ and walk away and then they're stuck. I know Christ, but I don't know how to live for Christ. And then they start going back into the world. And what Peter is saying here is you can't leave them alone. They'll be hounded on by the, uh, what's the word I could use here? Lower impactful Christians. New believers need to be taught the basic doctrines of the Word of God. Otherwise, they're going to be in danger of being led away. It's not just about being moral. It's not about knowing what's right and feeling, oh, I did good things. It's about being pleased to live for God, and that's not natural. You and I, they've been walking with God forever and a day. It's still not natural because we're in this flesh that we daily must be recuperating the, the expression of excitement to say, I want to live for God today. And if we don't help younger Christians want to live for God, then they're going to be pulled away. How can we as believers maintain a stable position and avoid being unstable Christians? How can we help others not be led astray? How can we be 
proper in this time between right at this moment and when Jesus comes back or we go to be with him? The answer is growing spiritually. Peter finishes by telling us this, verse 18, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's the goal. To be constantly growing is the literal translation that we should not grow in spurts, but in constant experience of development. And I'm going to take a little poke, and some of you are going to get bothered by this, and I'm not going to apologize, but here's what Scripture says. A little bit of God here and there is none of God. I just want you to know that. You can't just take a bite and then I'll go back when I realize I need more. If you want God in your life, then God is your life. It's very important that we grow in a balanced way. Knowledge without grace is a terrible weapon. And I've known those people, and I hope I've never been that person. And grace without knowledge leads people astray from a full relationship of, of, of knowing the one who gave you the grace. That there's a balance of knowledge and grace and then lived out. That's how we grow spiritually. So what's the result of a balanced spiritual life? Peter says it's glory to God. All of it falls under this. We are called to grow, and God's the one that receives the glory. We don't get cocky about it. We don't get ignorant about it. We don't get hesitant about it. We become bold about growing spiritually, and that glorifies God. It glorifies Him when we grow in knowledge. It glorifies Him when we grow in grace. It glorifies Him when we put those two together and live it out. Peter warns, the apostates are here, by the way, those are people who who pull others away and, and use mistruth. The apostates are here, and they're busy. They're seducing and, and twisting. They're influencing for the negative. We must guard our hearts. We must grow in his truth. We must glorify him as our Lord. We must make the most of every opportunity to win the lost and encourage them to grow in him. Let's pray. God, I know that every moment of time is a gift from you. Let us not squander it. Again, not that we're fearful that we may not have tomorrow, but because we're encouraged that you have given us today. Let that be our motivation. God, living for you in a world that doesn't want us to is tough. Thank you that you've not only forgiven us of our sins, but that you've made a way for us to grow in you. Thank you that you've given us your word. Thank you that we have it in book form. Thank you that we have places of worship and and, uh, people around us to share and grow and love us deeper in our relationship with you. God, let all of our time be focused on your will and your way. God, we are so grateful that when you saw the time fit, you sent your son, that his body was broken and his blood was shed on our behalf, that because of his sacrifice on the cross, We no longer have to be slaves to sin, but we can live in the righteousness we get from you. Thank you, God, for that. We love you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Again, this week, let's go ahead and just spend a few moments with the Lord, and and, uh, when you're ready, go ahead and take communion, and I'll be back with you in a few minutes, and uh, we'll close out.
Paul wrote in Hebrews 2 1. The whole concept of of what we're learning and and sticking to the truth of what we learned about God and Scripture. He says, therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. It's a nautical reference uh, about being grounded. Paul used a lot of nautical references. By the way, it doesn't take any energy to drift. It takes energy to hold. And he's saying, use your energy, hold on tight, pay close attention to what you've heard, lest you drift. If, if you don't understand, let me put it this way, the Christian life requires diligence. It's not something that's just natural. Nobody naturally, automatically falls into living for God. It's just not in us. But it's so easy we can naturally drift out of a proper relationship with them. So the warning here is secure yourself to the truth of the gospel. Hold tight to it so that you don't drift, so the winds don't blow, so that the waters don't and the current don't take you away. What I want to close with is this statement that the closest attention must be paid to the very serious matters of the Christian faith. I think God's sifting the church and wants to know who wants to live for him and who wants to just wear the t-shirt. And if we're going to impact this world, the shirt's not going to do it. The lives are. I love you. Thank you for an extra 11 minutes. I think they're just taking food out of the oven, so it's hot and fresh. Um, anybody that's over there that wants to lead in prayer, please do so. I'm always late getting over there. You are officially dismissed right out this door. Follow your nose to the food.